Hello, my name is Robert and I'm addicted to Pokemon Go. <laughs> but I can quit whenever I want to. Uh, but knowing that, or maybe unknowingly, Kenneth and Daniel still inviting me um, to get me away from that addiction. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here. This is the perfect kind of conference. I, I love the one-track conferences. A few hundred people, everyone's having the same conversations, seeing the same talks. Um, and with all, it, it actually, seriously, it's an honor being on the list with all the other great speakers. These are talks that I actually want to see. Uh, other places? Eh. But this is fantastic. So, um, and also with Kenneth joining Microsoft recently and suddenly only Windows computers work for presenting. Coincidence? I don't know. Uh, but I won't touch anything down here. Uh, kind of like a rat's nest. And as, as some of you might know, I'm Swedish. So I want to start by apologizing. Uh, any pain that we might have brought on your people, uh, we're trying to do better, uh, and we're trying to do the best we can. And it's also fun being Swedish and going to Denmark, because if we go to Norway, all the Swedes are slaves, so that's not much fun. But if we go to Denmark, Denmark's just full of really happy people, right? And, and at this time, uh, if it hasn't been for AV issues, I would expect that I would have been having good Danish beer and just relaxing. But having seen in the men's restroom that two out of three urinals are already broken, I don't know, maybe we're just a bit better. But also with Danish people, Danish people, in my experience, are always very open and happy. Uh, we might disregard what happened in the city last night, but otherwise, generally, you're happy and, and nice people. And coming from Sweden, our thing is more of just, we have a lot of feelings and opinions on the inside, but we're kind of very sort of passive aggressive in that sense. So I, I might be on fire on the inside and really excited about being here, but it won't show at all. Uh, so it's not, it's not personal, it's not you, it's me. And I've been working on the web for a long, long time, uh, since last century actually, uh, which sounds good to say, uh, at least if you're negotiating your salary. And I started as a web developer, just building things, looking at code back in the day of, of you know, mouse over was a, a big effect, uh, building things. And I got involved in the Mozilla community back in 2009, and giving talks at conferences and building Firefox extensions and things like that. And I did fairly well. Um, so I got employed back in 2011, and I was working as a technical evangelist at Mozilla, and I was working as the, the editor of the Mozilla Hacks blog and, and other things. And then a couple of years back, I left. But I mean, right, everyone has a past, right? So this is a young me. Uh, I think I would directly qualify into a Russian dating site with this. <laughs> so I don't know if, I, if my career has been going uphill or downhill since, but, but now, um, now I'm at Google. And what I do at Google is, and then I'm being lucky enough to be able to travel around to a number of different places and, and giving presentations and meeting people. And it, it sounds like such a cliche, uh, but the really nice thing about that is sort of getting away, and, and I think Bruce is going to talk more about it later, but getting away from sort of the Western world of the web, where sort of Western Europe and, and North America, most people are um, fairly spoiled when it comes to internet experiences and, and connections. But if you go to other places, they have completely different challenges. So I'm, I'm constantly learning and trying to figure out how we can do better. And, and the funny thing is, when I joined Google, and, and one of my perspectives here was I was working with any sort of Google product or technologies. I was working with the web, with Android, some cloud stuff and other things, which gave me a really interesting perspective. Because if you've been like in the web business for 15 plus years, you sort of get a narrow vision. So, so it was very important to see it from the other angle and actually try to sell the web to other people, because otherwise something like this, we're all friends in the web, great, yay. Uh, but also seeing how other people view the web and, and the web's opportunities, but also the, the shortcomings. And since I joined and was working with that initially, I'm working in Sweden in the Stockholm office, uh, but I don't have any real colleagues there. Well, I have colleagues, there's about 200 people there, but no one who works with the same thing as I do. So recently, we sort of grew out or our office, so they moved me up to floor eight to a temp space. 
Uh, so it was kind of a, a good office space feeling. Um, a funny thing about this, actually, I, I don't know if it's true, but you know, it's it's like the internet. If it's funny, you tell it, and then later you figure out if it's true. Uh, so with the stapler in the movie, the produced by Swingline, apparently when they did the movie, they didn't have any red staplers. So it was actually painted red for the movie. But after the movie, it was such high demand, so they had to start mass producing red staplers in that size because everyone wanted one. And I'm supposed to be here talking about the, the future of the web. And I before I go there, I do want to talk about the web as of today. So back in 2010, Wired magazine had an editorial declaring the web dead. Uh, and it's kind of tiring. Um, and, and you get all this you know, PR and media attention and all this trying to set up a fight or there's a conflict or someone has to die, uh, which isn't really the, the way it is. And then they got a new editor and apparently the web is alive again. So you should have looked beyond the corporate logo, but I mean the web as a whole. Um, and from our side, and just looking at Chrome, November last year, Chrome on mobile alone had 800 million users. In April, we reached 1 billion users. And that's only one web browser only on mobile. So if you get all the, all the other web browsers in as well and all the other different platforms, the web is massive. The web is pretty far from dead. Uh, so I think we should just stop worrying about this if you ever actually worried uh, and, and just keep on doing good things. And I think why we sort of got into this is that the web experience on mobile for a long time was something like this. And, and it's, it's shit, of course. Uh, and the web can actually offer many, many experiences. So, so there was never no real need. It more came from the, we need to have a native app, you know, like back it was in 99. We need to have a website. Why? We don't know. And, and we had the same, same experience around native apps. Uh, but I think right now, at least from um, Google side with search results, if you're having pop-ups or interstitials like this, you will get penalized in search results. Uh, so if you do something like this that actually ruins the user experience, it's not going to be good for you. So if you do, please don't. And also looking at the, the app hype, and, and to be completely honest with you, and, and shit, this is being recorded, but I work for a big company. We do everything, right? Uh, so I'm trying to choose my word carefully here. Uh, every platform is important in the ecosystem. I think that's the PR sentence. Uh, my view on it is that, I mean, of course, native apps is going to be around for a long time. Um, the web as well. I, I don't think none of them is going to go away soon. Uh, but I think we're seeing kind of a decline with the app hype. Uh, that most users don't download many new apps anymore. Uh, and when they do, or if they get a new device, generally it's, it's the big one, right? So you get Facebook, you get Twitter, you get a few um, Google Apps, Snapchat, etc. And that's about it. Most people use between three and five apps. And as for all the other apps, most of the apps out there are being opened once, people try them out, and then they go to die on like the third screen on your mobile or something. So, so I think the app boom is kind of going away. And I think another really exciting opportunity of the web is, of course, is that we have all these browsers. Uh, if you have all the kind of different native plat platforms, they're competing and they're building entirely separate infrastructures. The web is the same. I mean, whether you run the, the web in Firefox or Edge or Chrome or Opera or anything else, uh, it's just the web. And we shouldn't compete on web platform feature. We can compete on UX and speed and other stuff, but the core of it that delivers the user experience should be the same. With that said, um, is of course, I work at Google. So most of the things that I most that know about, the most about, at least, is things that we're trying to do, both from a web browser side, like what can we offer uh, in Chrome, and, and hopefully work with other vendors to see what they can do as well, where the browser would just fix stuff for you. And, and the other part is APIs and, uh, and approaches and things that we're working on right now. And generally, when we talk about the web as of today, more or less, we're talking about progressive web apps. And progressive web apps has sort of become, uh, don't quote me, uh, that's the thing you say when you want everyone to quote you. Uh, the, the, the progressive web apps is sort of the new HTML5. It's sort of everything that's making the web nicer in, in general, and especially on mobile, but not only on mobile, and giving a nice proper user experiences. 
but there are six main things that I want to point out that that sort of defines a progressive web app. And one is to make sure that they're instant loading. And we're having something like service workers to make sure that you can have offline support and cache things and, and control that. But not only for offline scenarios, but also for uh, you know, low connectivity or intermittent connectivity and things like that. Just making sure that for the users that things always load and always load something and that it goes fast. Second one is add to home screen. And within mobile web browsers, you have this menu, and then you can choose Add to Home Screen. Um, in Chrome, one thing that we have, if you visit a website twice, and it's been at least five minutes between those visits, we pop up this Install banner, which just asks the user, do you want to add this to your home screen? Basically, you, kind of, you keep on going back here. You seem to like it or don't know how to use your phone. We hopefully assume that they like it. Uh, and at least make them aware of that option of getting the icon on the home screen. The third one is push notifications. And a big thing around push notifications is re-engagement. Just getting users to return to your content, whether that's shopping or information or updates. But of course, an important thing with notifications, you know, with great power and all that, uh, it shouldn't be death by notifications. Uh, so there are many talks and, and walkthroughs on this, but generally with notifications, you should make sure that they're, of course, that they're relevant for the user, that they're in a timely fashion when they actually want it, and it gives a good context. I mean, shit like popping up like, you have five notifications, doesn't say anything, what happened, who did what, etc. So it, it needs to really make sense for the user. And beyond instant loading, we also want to make sure that, that we have really fast user experiences. Uh, I'll just briefly touch on, we, we have one project called AMP, which stands for Accelerated Mobile Pages, which is just one approach of trying out instant content and, and making sure it loads fastly. But in general, for everything in the mobile web, it's just making sure that once it has loaded, that it's smooth. You don't have a lot of jank in the, in the scrolling, and then the animations actually work. And when you navigate within the page and between pages, it's actually a nice, good experience. And also, of course, making it secure. And I think this is just, it, we have to do this. We need to use HTTPS for everything on the web. and most, if not all, APIs that are coming out right now uh, will require HTTPS. And, and we need it to make sure the web is a, a secure and reliable platform. And the final part, which is actually a, a fantastic thing about the web, if you just, uh, I'm not going to try and sound like a marketer, but you know, just sprinkle some CSS on this. But I mean, in general, if you're working with responsive and just adapting things to different screen sizes, and then you lo load the respective resources depending on, on what kind of uh, device you have, Basically, if you write something on the web, it could more or less run on anything, everywhere. So the, the general overlook on progressive web apps today is that we make sure, or we believe we are already there and just fine tuning it, but making sure that they're reliable and fast and engaging and secure. Those, those are the main things. And, and while other people are proclaiming the web dead, we come pretty far in, in only the last few years. The, the, all the number of different APIs and features and approaches that were actually being supported. We're making lots of progress instead of just trying to fight or, or argue that we're actually not dead. So for me, the web is sort of already almighty powerful. It, it's a fantastic thing, and we should never doubt that. So that's where I believe where we are today. Uh, but it's also just the beginning. It's not like, oh, we reached a point where we can sort of match native, we're done. Uh, it's, it's just what's kind of needed to play to actually be able to compete with native apps and, and the native offerings. But it's, it's only the table stakes. So what about the future? Where, where are we going? And when I talk about the future, uh, I don't necessarily mean, you know, robots being built by old mobile phones or something like that, which is cool, but uh, and, and not, you know, flying cars or, or shit like that. I'll, I'll let Stephanie talk about IoT. Um, when I talk about the future, it's more about what we're doing right now or within the next year or maybe within the next couple of years. Because if I have some fancy vision of the future, what's going to happen in five years, there's a big likelihood that it won't happen or it's just, you know, it's giving you hope and then you go back to your ordinary day job. It's not fun anymore. So I actually want to talk about the future and things that matters to you now. And the general things I'll be going through is knowing who the user is, uh, credentials management, paying for things on the web, which is extremely important, 
connecting with hardware, the physical web, and uh, web VR. Uh, web VR was kind of a nice lead up to Liv's talk, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, I was doing panic changes to my slides here to, to make some sense at least. So with knowing who the user is, it, it's still on the web, uh, and in particular on mobile, signing in and, and doing things on the web is, is really hard. Like you come to a sign-in form like this, uh, and once you see all of these things, like you don't really know which account you used. You did you use Facebook or Google? You usually know which email you used. You have no clue whatsoever which password you used. And then you need to figure out, did I ever actually sign up? Should I get my fifth account in this website? Uh, or, 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 you know, finally you find the, the magical forgot password link and then you start over, rinse and repeat, uh, and then you change the password every time you use that website. Is there anyone in here who has never used forgot password? Okay, we're good. This is like a support group. Uh, and of course, typing on mobile screens is, is really, really hard. Uh, Getting things right and, and making sure that you type things in is, is difficult, and especially depending on what kind of keyboard you get as well. And it leads to stuff like this. You know what this is? This, yes, this is the most popular password in 2015. Uh, I don't know what happened to QWERTY. QWERTY was good, right? You said the But also, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 uh, is a new winner. Uh, it actually pushed down the second most popular password for a few years, which was the word password. Uh, so we're seeing some change in the industry. Uh, it's very disruptive. Uh, but of course, I mean, th this poses an enormous security risk, and, and people are using passwords across websites. Don't do that. Uh, I know you do, but don't. Um, and it's a big issue. And, and one way we try to approach it from the web browser side is introducing Smart Lock, uh, which is sort of the, the password manager within Chrome. And we have roughly about 8 billion sign-ins that is being done through the Smart Lock feature automatically in Chrome right now. And generally, it doesn't take any work from a developer or very little work from a developer. Uh, but sometimes when the browser comes and it sees a form, it's kind of hard to figure out what each field actually means. Sometimes it, it's completely obvious, sometimes it's not. But something that you can use is the autocomplete attribute, which is just a really, really small addition to your web page, but just helping the browser understand, OK, well, this is the name of the user, home telephone number, username, etc. And for instance, if you have a sign-in form, you can have username and current passwords. So we automatically know what to autofill. Um, I'm really happy that this slide is popular. And <laughs> so I ruined it. Sorry. Um, and an important thing to point out here is it doesn't just say password, it says current password. And it's knowing that it's something that you're already using that, and that should be autofilled for you. And if you compare that with a sign up form uh, where you have new password, or maybe you've gone to the forgot password site, I don't know. Uh, but if you have a new password, uh, two important things about that. One is, if you have a new password, we won't try and autofill it. Uh, we will know that it's a blank field or we're expecting something new. The other part that's more interesting is from the browser side is that we know that users need a secure password. Users aren't generally really good at secure passwords. So the browser can generate the password for you. So instead of having users with passwords like this, we can generate this. I mean, not this exactly, but something like this. Uh, otherwise, it would be kind of, you know. Um, and what we're trying to do in Chrome right now, we're working in um, auto-generating passwords for users. So basically, you don't have to worry about it, and we're making sure that they have secure and unique passwords. And it's in Canary and Dev and, and beta channels right now, and I'm hoping to deploy it soon more widely. So in general, if you have forms in your web page, use the autocomplete attribute. It makes a lot of sense. It's not all the work, and, and it helps a lot. Which leads me on to the, the credentials management API. Um, and from our side, we just shipped this in Chrome. And I think we're going to see it soon in, in all browsers out there. And it allows you as a developer to integrate with a browser's credential manager. And, and for instance, if you look at AliExpress here and, and offering something like auto sign-ins, um, 
basically, if people go to the website and they get automatically signed in, and then they can buy shit. The, the keyword density for the word shit is going to be strong today. And, and that's the thing, right? You want to offer users a, a really nice, seamless user experience. It might be, not be a natural way in the web page where, you know, oh, you seem to like this nice thing. Here's the form. And then you need to start filling it out. If you're already in there, you already have an account, we can just sign users in. And the way you do that through code is, is actually quite simple. You have a navigator.credentials object. You call the get method um, to get the password. And the important part here is that you also use unmediated. And what unmediated means that is that a user won't get a prompt that pops up and, and blocks their user flow. It, they will just be automatically signed in, no issues, no hassles. And generally, from the Chrome side, uh, we offer automatic sign-in for web pages uh, if it's enabled. And also, if you have only one credential saved for that website. And again, you're going to see a trend here. Uh, Navigator credentials is restricted to secure context, meaning HTTPS. And of course, passwords aren't directly exposed to JavaScript. And also with the fetch method, it only submits credentials to the same site endpoint. So once you've gotten the credentials object back, you can just call fetch and send it into your server for verification, pass in the credentials that you got, and then just sign them in. Then there are other cases where you might have uh, more than one credential, so don't want to have automatic sign-in. In that case, you can just pop something up, and you can choose the account you want to use, and you get logged in. So, so it's one, one step forward, just a, a one-tap sign-in. And code-wise, it looks exactly the same as before. The only thing that's been removed is the unmediated part, meaning you'll get a prompt, you choose, and then you're good. And, and that's all good and well for uh, getting people logged in, and especially automatically. Uh, but you can also, as a developer, get more control when to store passwords or, or when to trigger the save password feature in the web browser. Um, so for instance, you can get a reference to a form within the web page, and then you create a new password credential, and then you just pass in the form. Basically just telling the browser, right, right now, save this. This is good. And we also support federated logins. Uh, so in, for instance, if you use Facebook logins or Google Plus, uh, I'm sorry, I got something in my throat. Uh, you can also do that as well. Um, so you just create a new federated credential object, um, and then you have the, the username of the user, and then also specify which provider you're using right now. And, and finally, the important part here of this is also logging the user out. Because if you have automatic sign-in, for instance, you want to make sure there's an option for the user, like as soon as they get out, they don't get automatically in again as well. And you just call require user mediation for that. And a, a few companies have started working on this, like LinkedIn, Guardian, AliExpress. Um, so you, you should go there and try it out and just see what experience is like. From, from our side, we shipped it in Chrome 51. And this takes me on to paying for things on the web. And, and I think this is a critical area. If we look at the, the different app stores and play stores and, and the success of native apps, from a user angle, just you know, having your credit card stored in there and just going in and buying more and more shit. Uh, if it's easy, you'll do it, right? And we haven't really been there on the web so far. And, and I think that's one of the main success factor for native platforms as well. That it's just easy. You can buy new apps or you can buy things within apps. And, and with sort of the rise of mobile computing and the majority of, of especially commercial traffic coming from mobile devices, even if it's harder on the web, we still see that on mobile devices, 66% of purchases are on the web on mobiles and not through apps. So again, the web is not really dead. It's doing fairly well. And looking at some actually fairly recent stats throughout Europe, it's generally people using the web on mobile for buying things. Uh, pretty consistent throughout Europe. I don't know about the UK and Germany. I'm not going to draw any conclusions. Uh, but I guess it's going to be going up there a bit as well. And there's also, and I'll share the slides later so you can see in detail, but it's also interesting to see different shopping actions and what kind of platform or approach that users are choosing as well to approach that. So people buy things on the mobile web, OK? So that's good. One thing that actually isn't that good, though, is seeing that on 
the mobile web versus the desktop web is that we only see 66% uh, fewer conversions. So basically, it's only one third as many conversions on mobile web versus desktop. And, and that's not good. It's still a lot, but it's not good. And, but the reason why is actually pretty simple, and, and it's forums, right? And generally, the way we look at forums is they're, they're manual, it's a lot of hard work, and it's tedious to fill out. It's kind of slow, and, and it takes a, a huge number of taps to actually be getting through. And especially like on a mobile device, if you're going to fill out billing address or credit card number, something like that, you don't get the number keyboard and you just keep on, it's like, ah, and then you get a computer. So again, sort of from the browser side, it, we're trying many different things. And one thing that we're looking at is autofill and just making sure that you making sure that you can fill web forms with a single click. So if you get in, if you have all the information stored, why would you have to fill it in over and over again? And from the web browser side, your, your this credit card and the address information, all of that is being saved in Chrome. Uh, and generally, we see like a 95% accuracy. There are some forums that are just weird. We blame them, not us, of course. Uh, but, it, but it's getting better and better. And then the form gets filled out automatically. And then, of course, you can synchronize this information between your different devices, different mobile phones, desktop, etc. And And only from autofill, which is only one approach, uh, we've seen a 25% increase in the conversion rate. So it's just the small things that makes it less painful for users to do things. Um, and, and that's what I think we should be aiming at. So with autofill, we're taking care of, of the first half. So from manual and tedious, we're sort of getting more into automatic and simple. But it's still kind of slow, and it still takes a certain amount of taps. So imagine a world without forums. It, it would be a beautiful world, uh, and it'll probably never happen. But imagine. One way we're trying to see how we can work with payments is through something called payment request. Uh, so having a standardized API that's being developed in the open by W3C, uh, and just have a, a simple JavaScript API, and then let the different browsers take care of the complicated parts of the payment. So now you can get to one tap checkouts and no forms. Um, and the way it's being developed right now is in the W3C Web Payments Working Group. And it's, of course, making sure that we have a payment approach that's cross-browser. So we stop building things only in, in one browser. And kind of signed out from, from our side as well. We're not, or we're sort of taking away Chrome apps as well, uh, just for the sake of instead of building apps with Web technology only for Chrome, you should build for entire web platform. So everything should be going in that direction. Stop pushing things into just one browser. And making sure that we have um, cross-browser support for this. Uh, and our implementation that we started with has been in Chrome on mobile, because we think that the, the biggest pain for users is on mobile, and it's way, way harder there than on desktop. But naturally, over time, we want to make sure that we have cross-platform support and it works on any kind of device. And also that we support more or less any kind of payment provider as well. Um, so we can basically support everything. So same as with Autofill, with payment requests, you, you make sure that it's automatic and simple, but it also actually now becomes fast. And you're going from multiple amount of taps to one taps. Uh, so it's, a, it's an enormous improvement. And the code for that. Uh, the code that we support that's been shipped right now uh, is based on the first uh, public working draft from W3C. So what you see here might change, but it might most likely be something like this over time and not change. And the first parameter, it's really easy. It's just an array of different uh, payment methods or credit cards that you support. And, and the browsers go through the available methods that you have in your browser. Uh, default case is just the browser is looking for, for credit cards, basically. Uh, and the next items here are just the line items, basically the things that you're buying and the cost for them. And then finally, at the end, you have a Boolean specifying whether you want to request an extra cost uh, for shipping. So as a user, the way it can look is that you can go in somewhere, um, and then no forms, no hands, no forms. Uh, and this just pops up, and you choose your payment option, and then if they were asking for uh, an extra shipping cost, it pops up. You choose whichever one you want. 
and then you uh, process the request, and you're done. You paid for something. Uh, it's amazing, right? It is amazing. God damn it. Thank you. Even though I'm Swedish, I appreciate it. Uh, but of course, credit cards is one thing. And, and from our side, uh, last year we launched Android Pay. Uh, and, and Android Pay has actually been going really well on, on mobile and through native apps as well. But of course, we need to bring that on the web as well. And, and, and the way we see Android Pay is an even more secure tokenized version of your card. And it's not saying that, oh, we have this browser. We also have a payment method. Use all our stuff. It's just one way, right? And in this case, we know the payment method, and we can try it out and, and see how it works. But it's really easy uh, that you have all the credit cards, and if you have another payment method like Android Pay, you just add that to the array. And then depending on the payment method that you choose, it might require different payment parameters. But in essence, the API for you as a developer should be the same. Uh, and then if you're using other payment providers, you should still just specify that. It might need is a, a few unique parameters, but overall the core should be the same for you. So where can you start using this? Uh, back in May, we started shipping it behind the flag. Uh, now, in, in August, it actually came out in uh, Chrome 53, uh, and we're going to launch the Chrome Stable later this year. So that's our sort of where we are right now. And then next year, of course, is making sure that we support more than just mobile and that we support more payment providers as well and make it much richer. Uh, and again, a few companies started working with this and have sort of bits and pieces in production. Um, so you can try it out. And, and I really do want to stress that to W3C, to us, to anyone else, give us feedback on this because it's about time that we get payments right on the web and make sure that it's really, really good. So we've been logging users in. We've been paying for things. Uh, then we need to connect to fun stuff. And the web has you know, already so far had access to accelerometers, game controllers, camera in some forms, uh, audio input and output and such. So when I talk about connecting with hardware, it's more about uh, things like Bluetooth. And that's necessarily overpriced headsets, uh, but more like heart rate sensors and smaller things and all the things that we're getting out there that actually have Bluetooth support right now. And currently, we're at version 4 with Bluetooth, or something generally referred to as BLE which is Bluetooth Low Energy. And it's interesting seeing the evolution of transfer rates over time, uh, because Wi-Fi and Ethernet, it, it's been going pretty well. With Bluetooth, in, in version 3, we had 54 megabits per second. That's, that's pretty decent. Version 4 has 0 0.3. What the Firefox, right? What happened? Uh, might see, seem like it's bad, right? Uh, but there are two main factors for why everyone went down that path. And it's power consumption and cost of producing devices. You want to make sure that devices can run for as long as possible without necessarily being connected or need charging or changing batteries or something like that. And then, of course, producing lots of different devices out there, um, keeping the cost down. And from the web Bluetooth angle, We've connected remote control race cars, uh, low energy printers, uh, Spheros BB-8 robot, which is fun. Uh, but also other things like the Dotty, which is a, a Bluetooth LED notification display. Uh, so I thought I'd be brave enough because things have been going well technically so far. So I, so I thought I'd try a demo. And what I have here is something called the play bulb candle. It's good that it's dark in here. So I know there's no Wi-Fi, but you know, data, right? So what I do from within a web page here is that I can connect and looking for devices around me, and then I find I get a pop-up and I get play bulb candle, and then I pair with it which means that the phone from within the web browser right now is connected to the candle. And then I can pick the different candle effects that I want to have. If I want to make sure that it's uh, flashing, I know it's amazing, the, the progress we're doing as mankind. Uh, but just easily connecting things through the web browser, right? And since it's a candle, I think I can blow it out. Let's try. <laughs> 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 Pretty cool. 
And, and if you have a play bulk handle or something similar to that, uh, the code is in GitHub. Uh, so basically, you can just go into a page, look for different devices nearby, and connect to them. And the way Bluetooth works here is that you have two basic terms. You have the central device, which is a phone. You have a peripheral device, which is the candle in this case. But then you also have something called GAT, which is a generic attribute profile. And basically, the central device connects to the peripheral device through the GAT server. Uh, and basically, the, the GAT server provides me information to the web, you just tell me what kind of services and characteristics does this specific Bluetooth device support. Basically, how can I interact with this? What can I do? And within the code, you have navigator.bluetooth, and then you call request device. And you get this modal picker within the web browser and just find the devices nearby. And as you see, the options parameter in here is mandatory. And it's basically, there's a, a lot of Bluetooth stuff out there. So it's just making sure that I only want to find Bluetooth devices that support a certain service that I want to connect to, not see all kinds of, of Bluetooth devices. Just trying to make it easy. And also with the request device method, uh, it needs a user interaction. So basically, it needs a tap or something like that. You can't just auto load it when people go into your page. And the other part, again, as well, it requires HTTPS to make sure that it's secure. You can try things out on localhost as well, but generally, if you put things out in the wild, HTTPS is a thing. And once you're connected to a, a, a device or, or paired it with a device, you connect to its GET server and get access to that. And when you have the GET servers, you start by getting the primary service. For instance, you want to check the, the battery service. So you get the primary service for battery, and then you get the characteristics, so you can read out the battery level. Uh, and then you just have easy methods uh, like reading out or using the read value method and seeing the, the level of the battery right now. And vice versa, you can write things to devices as well. So same thing, like in, in the case of the candle here, you connect to the, the candle service UUID, you get the characteristic, uh, which is the color, and then instead you just write the value. You write the colors to the candle, which is kind of easy. And then, of course, with, with all kinds of Bluetooth devices out there, with candle service UUID and color UUID, it's kind of magical. Usually, you have no idea what they name their things. And, and some people are better at naming stuff than other ones. So most devices come with uh, programming guides. But if you don't have that, uh, on Android, for instance, you can install control software. And then you turn on the developer option in settings. And then just capture all Bluetooth packets and then go through them and see what, what things have been named. And in this case, I can talk about it since it actually worked. Uh, you can also have event listeners. Uh, so if a characteristic or the value of a characteristic changes on a Bluetooth device, um, I can track that. So basically, you know, if you blow the candle out, I will know that it happened and then act accordingly. I, really briefly want to mention web NFC as well. Uh, and it's just, you know, NFC, right? But again, on the web. Uh, so you can connect through different devices and then working with JSON and, and things like that. And actually, I'm not trying to take more glory out of that because you have your own local hero here, uh, Kenneth Christiansen, um, who's also one of the spec editors for web NFC. This is actually the best picture I can find of him. So you can imagine the shit I went through. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to say that. Uh, so, but, you know, speak to Kenneth. Uh, he's great. And, and also getting different APIs and there's another specification working on generic sensors. So let's say you, you would have sensors for basically anything. Like if you want to measure the tire pressure on the right-hand side of your car and getting the value uh, and things like that. Um, or just general you know, geolocation sensors, having event handlers, and, and things like that. And talking about devices and talking about web Bluetooth, it kind of takes me on to the, the physical web. And basically, what the physical web is about is beacons. So you have small things like this. And the only thing they do, the only reason to exist, is that they broadcast a URL. So basically, if I'm close to something like this with my phone, it shows me uh, one or several URLs, and I can go in there and, and find some information that's relevant for where I am right now. 
Uh, and again, with sort of the filtering, uh, you can have something installed uh, on your phone that only shows you things that actually broadcast the URLs. So you don't get all of the other stuff. And if you're at a train station, for instance, you can go there and then on your phone, you get a URL and you can check the train schedule right away. Um, or if you're parking your car, you can pay for parking without actually leaving the car. Um, so anything just through a URL, uh, which is pretty cool. Someone wants this? I'll, I'll try and throw something in the dark and see. Yeah, that went well. <laughs> I know you wanted it, actually. I was just trying to, it's like playing pool. If I go by. Uh, but also for the future, uh, we're looking into something called referring device, um, which is with these beacons, uh, the broadcast URL right now. But if you connect that more closely to web Bluetooth and, and accessing the GET servers of the device, we can interface with more features of that device directly. And the current state of web Bluetooth is behind the experimental flag in Chrome OS, Chrome for Android, Chrome for Linux, etc. We're working hard on making sure that we have more stable versions on OS X and Windows. You can try it out, but it's, you know, sometimes it works, and that's fun. Uh, and it's also implemented in Opera as well, uh, which is great. And since we actually started building this and not just specking it and, and, and only talking about it, there's been a huge interest in this. And I'm really hoping that more web browsers will come along as well and start building it in. And this, uh, I'm not going to say that my thunder was stolen, but you know. Uh, but I think lived it great. So, so I'll try and, and talk around that a bit. And I think with web VR or Bluetooth or NFC or something like that, way, way, way back when I'd at least I had traces of hair, um, I was working for a company called Razorfish. And their motto, their slogan was that everything that can be on the web will be, which is so nice. It was a very nice American and we were waving flags and shit. But, but beyond that, I think they're right. The web is, is such a good platform and, and so spread out. So, of course, if we do virtual reality, of course we should have it on the web. Why wouldn't we? Uh, you know, having our native is like Flash. We're trying shit out and then we ship it properly on a real platform. And the state of, of where we are right now, and as, as Liv was saying, uh, it landed in Firefox nightly um, two weeks ago. Uh, during the fall, um, I'm trying to get into Chrome. Uh, I assume Edge is getting in there close. Um, soon as well. And at Google I.O., which is our big developer conference um, a few months ago, we launched a platform called Daydream. And basically, we, we've had this cardboard things and, and just putting a phone in and, and look at things. And, and same with um, Samsung's option as well, which is a, a really good one. So with Daydream, it's not necessarily one product per se. So it's more of a specification of like the minimum requirement of what a user experience should be. So with cardboard, for instance, that the average view viewing time is about two minutes, and then people get tired. Uh, so within the specification, a headset requires a headband to make sure that it stays there. And of course, you have your phone, but also that you have a remote very similar to this one. Uh, because when you're in VR mode, you don't really want to have an Xbox controller or something like that, because it's like, if, if you're not used to a controller like that, it's like holding a spider in your hand, right? So it's a very simple controller. You have one button to, to make choices. It has a motion controller when you move around. But it also, as you see on top, it's a touchpad. So you could either use it sort of like a gamepad, or you can uh, swipe things through as well. Um, and of course, trying to bring the same experience to the web here as well. Like the Chrome team is working to make sure that on any Daydream device, which would be uh, potentially Google devices, but we also have Samsung and other people that have committed to building things based on Daydream and having that minimum bar. Um, and then from Chrome side, getting a full browser experience within the, the Daydream context. And as Liv was mentioning, if you want to get started with this, and if it really sounds interesting, I really do recommend A-Frame from the Mozilla VR team. Uh, and it wraps 3GS and WebGL uh, in HTML custom elements. Uh, so it's really easy. You can try things out and actually get things working. One thing that you have already today on the web as well now is VR view for the web. So let's say you have a panorama picture or a 360 video or something like that. 
you can put it within your website, and then if you just grab and hold, you can just look around and see what the experience is like. But also, if you have a VR headset, you can go in there and you put the phone in and you get the full VR experience, which is great for, especially for travel site, you would have TripAdvisor or Hotels.com or something like that. So you get slightly closer to seeing what it's like being there right now. And seeing that the Oculus CEO and one of the co-founders, Brendan, uh, is also excited about where we are, sends some nice implications about where we're heading with this. So from the Google side, for me and, and my way smarter colleagues, uh, whatever doesn't work for you, let us know. I mean, and not only Chrome, like any platform, because we're working together. So we have crbug.com uh, for reporting bugs. We have Chrome status that's showing the status of a number of new features, but also with direct links to respective bugs if you want to follow up on something. Uh, we're available on Slack for talking and chatting and stuff like that. We try to publish most talks or walkthroughs on YouTube uh, what does that mean? Uh, it means you ruined my first talk. I'm going to go on. Um, and also, of course, we're on Twitter, uh, so you can find us there. Uh, and I do want to end with a note that the, the web has been sort of the big five for a long time. Uh, and it's, I, I, and I'm getting kind of sick of the when people are trying to fight, you're trying to pick the best one, et cetera. So it's more about, we're working together. I, I'm personally meeting with uh, people from all of these companies on a regular basis, just to make sure that we, we all have a joint interest in making sure that the web is good. Let's compete with other things around that, but the web has to be good and consistent. And of course, right now, it's way beyond this. We have a, a ton of different mobile web browsers. Uh, the one on, on the far left, the Android browser, I'm sorry. Uh, but we're getting Chrome out more and more there as well. But also seeing on the right-hand side with Samsung's internet browser, which is really good, uh, and then UC browser, um, which is extremely big, especially in, in China, but and around in Asia as well. So I do want to stress the point of, for us as from the browser side, but also from you as developers, the, the web is a freak show, right? But it's a, it's a beautiful freak show and a wonderful representation of humanity uh, and then just getting the democracy part of that as well like everyone can contribute and everyone can actually be part of making things better so talking about the, the future of the web and falling over ledge and all of that I think the important future of the web right now is having sort of good but realistic dreams like making forms and payments and things like that easier connecting to different things building richer experiences and uh, and and the web is fucking awesome, and let's make sure we don't mess that up. Thank you. Mange tak.